Thank you all for being here. We'll start with a few questions um, from me, and then we'll definitely open up to the audience later on. Just um, for a, uh, to set some, some background, uh, this project originated as a soundstage play in 2005 for Carter Burwell's Theater for the New Year. So could you, uh, perhaps Charlie and Duke, speak about how the film came about, and then also how you began to visualize something that wasn't visual to begin with? Um, yeah, the play was uh, what we call a sound play, and the idea was that it was a st sort of a staged radio play. Um, the actors were on stage. It was the same actors, Jennifer, David, and Tom. And Carter Burwell with his musicians, and we had a Foley artist, and um, the actors were reading the scripts, and it was sort of, the idea was to create the imagery in the audience's minds, and dialogue was... Um, ambiguous enough in places that different imagery, hopefully, for different people would, would come to mind. So that was the, that was the original play. And then um, my friend Dino Stamatopoulos uh, was in the audience uh, the night, one of the nights, and he really liked the play. And he subsequently founded a, uh, an animation studio called Starburns Industries, where Duke is a partner and a director. And um, he liked the play, and we talked about it over the years. And um, in 2011, they came and asked me if they could make it into a stop motion animation. So um, that was, you know, and I said, you know, they could if they could raise the money. And I really kind of expected nothing to happen. Um, and they went about it, and they eventually went to Kickstarter and, and raised some money there, and that kind of got us started. And if you want to you answer the second part about how we began visualizing it. The hard part, yeah. You can do that part. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, so uh, we did a Kickstarter, and we got some money, and it was very successful for us. It wasn't enough to make the whole movie, but it was enough to get started. So the very first thing we did was get the actors back together, the same three original actors that were in the stage performance. And uh, we hadn't talked about any visualization or anything yet. Um, we did this first, and we got the actors together, in a, in a sound stage in Los Angeles, and we recorded them all together, which is kind of unique. Usually they record the actors individually, um, but we got them all together and recorded the whole film in sequence um, together, overlapping each other and interacting with each other. And it was um, different than the stage performance in that it was, it was smaller and it was more intimate and um, it was very. It was a very emotional experience for all of us, and uh, um, it just. It was very inspiring. So we took that the tone of that experience of, of recording the actors together into the creative design. And the first conversations we had were about how can we translate this small, fragile, um, emotional experience that we had into these puppets and the design and the aesthetic and it just lended itself to being um, more realistic. And then as we started designing the puppets and we knew that we wanted them to function in a certain way, we wanted them to have very subtle naturalistic movements and so um, the design came into play, the practicality of how to make these puppets move and and so we decided on uh, this type of style of animation, of replacement animation, where the face is split across the eyes and there's different brow pieces and different mouth pieces that are um, 3D printed. And there's hundreds of different brows and hundreds of different mouth pieces. And there, you can um, swap out all the different pieces to create the performance. And so once we saw the seams, that became part of the aesthetic and, and we liked that. We liked that it made it clear um, what it was, that it was, that it was stop motion animated um, and that you know, it gave it a, sort of a, 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 a fractured quality and added to the, um, the fragility and of, of, of the aesthetic. Were there any um, kind of shared uh, references that you had or, or um or just that you were looking to in the history of animation in terms of the genre of being able to be something that is avant-garde and also something that can uh, contain or express you know, tragic comedy, uh, surrealism, uh, 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 expressive subjectivity. Were, were there any 
any name, any of the artists you had in mind? Or are you kind of starting creating a new form? Yeah, I mean, we looked at a lot of different stuff. We looked at Eastern European and Svenkmeyer animation, and we looked at um, uh, uh, Susie Templeton, and, and we looked at Madame Tootley Pootley, and um, we, we looked at a lot of different types of animation and styles of animation, but we also looked at a lot of live action references, and we looked at uh, Barton Fink and David Lynch and Wong Kar Wai, and also paintings and, you know, a, a lot of different references kind of melded together. And Jennifer, perhaps could you speak about the process of, uh, I guess, recording or, sh or shooting, or maybe recording is the be better term, the film, um, without having the visual component that is usually accompanied in, in, in um, developing and, and acting a character? How did you navigate, Lisa, the things that the story or script did tell us and the things that both in the stage and in perhaps in the making of the film weren't known? Um, well, that was actually pretty easy because we had done it as a radio play. Mm -hmm. And although we had done it 10 years before, there was someone doing Foley, um, so you would see someone making the you know, footsteps and, or the ice bucket, and the audience got to witness that, and all the actors, me and David and Tom, were just sitting in chairs. Um, and we loved that experience and didn't want it to. We only did it two nights. So we were all pretty sad when it ended. And did you rehearse? Is that yeah, we yeah, rehearsed for a week. We rehearsed it for a week actually here in New York, and then we did it at Royce Hall in Los Angeles. So then 10 years later, when Charlie said we were going to do it as a film and as you know, stop-motion animation, it was really exciting. It made perfect sense. It's just such a, a brilliant marriage, I think. Um, and it was incredibly intimate, and it was very... It was, there was something kind of effortless and dreamy about it, in a way. I mean, it was incredibly focused work because you can't, you have to think about what you're wearing because if you're wearing something that, that rustles a lot, you're gonna ruin a take. And, you know, you had to, we had to tape all our scenes, you know, the pages next to each other so that they didn't make, move, you know, they didn't make sound when you turned a page. And you were aware of the sound, but you were so aware of the sound that you could communicate so much doing so little. And there's something really, as an actor, that's really beautiful and freeing about that. And the material is so good that you don't, you really just say it and it feels alive, you know? And so what was the process for you, let's say, between the end of the recording and the, f the finished film? Did, were you uh, part of the creation of Lisa after that, or, or was... I just sat home and ate. And <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I usually try to do. The yeah. funny thing is, is we filmed her you know, we, we, filmed, we filmed the voice records with six cameras. So even though she was <laughs> working on other projects and things, uh, we were constantly referencing her, her movements and her, That's what my and, question was yeah. supposed to be, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, um, Jennifer is, is very much Lisa in the film, the physicality mm -hmm. as well as the voice. So I'd like to try to um, delve in more into the the animation, I guess, in two different ways. Um, one that you mentioned is uh, how it's naturalistic and, and very subtle, and um, I feel like throughout the film, at certain times, it uh, fades away, and you're really immersed in the emotion of, of what's happening, and then other times, it's very present as a, you know, either a barrier or you're just aware of the dislocation. Um, maybe if uh, that's something you were actively thinking about, if you could speak about that. And then, this is a long question, but to the second part, which I hope you could all speak about, is how uh, the film, to me, uh, renders, uh, represents human emotion, love, loneliness, unhappiness, in a way that I haven't seen in any kind of film in a really long time. And if it's something that you saw that the specific medium could do, or it, it, I suspect, rather, a combination of so many things, of the story, of, of the actors, of of this technology. So if, if there are anything there that you'd like, any of you would like to speak about, please jump what in. What was the first part of the question again? <laughs> the first part, see you make very complex films, so they're very complex questions. The first oh, part, I remember the, so, the subtlety yeah. of you go back and the kind of receives and pulls away. Uh, the, uh, the well, I mean, I think we have a couple of things at play in the movie. One is that we have sort of very, uh, you know, very good voice performances and very subtle um, animation very realistic characters, 
but you know the, the way they look it's very realistic the environment is very realistic but they also look like puppets you know and so they've got the seams across their their faces and you can you can um you know their proportions are slightly um unusual and you can see the chatter and the clothing you know where the animators are working so you you're reminded i think um um uh, of, of the fact that they're puppets and it, that it's animation every once in a while and it brings you, maybe it brings you out and then, it, and then somehow the performances both by the animators and by the actors then bring you back in. Um, and I think that is a, um, I, I, think, I think it is an intentional thing, um, a desired thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always really interested in that sort of tension between, you know, having an emotional impact and also um, making people aware that they're, reminding people that they're watching something that is, that is uh, not real, you know? So um, I think that was part of what we were, were trying to do here. Um, and I don't remember what the other part was now, sorry. It was about um, the, how the film as a whole represents human emotion or connection between people in a way that I think is very rare to see. It's uh, very tender. It's awkward. It's uh, fleeting. Uh, ultimately, um, if you could speak about, uh, perhaps. I mean, we just tried yeah. to be honest. I think. I think everybody working on it tried to be honest in, in what in what their work was. You know, and we tried to be honest in the performances, and with the animators tried to be honest in the in the creation of the of the um, action. And this, I tried to be honest with the script, and then then I don't think we're trying for anything like, oh, we're doing this in a way that no one's ever done it before. It's more, um, if there is that kind of reaction, maybe it's a result of just, I don't know, trying to do something honest. I agree with you, and, yeah. and the fact that uh, the romance especially, it's, it's not formulaic. I mean, it's as if there's never been a love story before when you, when you see you know, Michael and Lisa, and I think that's just a testament to uh, what, you, what you just said, kind of making a, a story in an honest way. Do either of you want to chime in on either of those long-winded questions? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to repeat what I said. <coughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the first part of the question again? It was uh, about how... Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. About, about the the, <laughs> uh, the variation in the in the animation, how the puppets in some moments. Oh yeah, how are... how it how it, how sometimes you're aware that they're puppets, and sometimes how. Uh, yeah, I I I, agree, I I think that that's true, and uh, you know I, I we certainly you know we talked about moments where we wanted uh, we wanted people to be certainly pulled into the experience of these characters. I mean, like, you know, the sex scene, for example, is, is, is a scene where, you know, we were conscious of, of you know, puppets having sex and how, <laughs> how that could be funny and, and how, you know, uh, Team America and, and things, you just say that and people laugh because they remember how, you know, that scene. And we discussed that and we, we didn't want to betray the characters in that scene by suddenly this being a joke. It, it just, we just wanted it to feel, you know, the, the love scene between Michael and Lisa starts when they enter that hotel room and, and you know, ends at the end of that scene and it, it should feel like a natural progression to that point and their interactions within that scene should feel like these two characters, how they would interact with each other in, in that moment and, and we, that was very important to us. I mean, it's the same thing Charlie said. We wanted to be honest. <laughs> That's what we tried to do. Ditto. Did you, ha did you want to add anything about the, the romance and the um, tender, well, awkward? Uh... For me, it was just very uh, surreal to see it because I've made m movies before. Um, <laughs> but I've always seen myself in them. And so in this, I, I felt like I was watching some, a movie for the first, like I'd never seen a movie before, almost, because it is so groundbreaking, really. And to be a part of that is really exciting. And I kept forgetting that I was in it. And I also forgot that they were puppets, because she doesn't look like me. You know, she actually was found in a uh, cafe 
cafeteria or a restaurant or something, right? Yeah, the Rosa, uh, the producer Rosa Tran spotted this woman at a at uh, Little Dom's, and <laughs> she's in a pink coat back there. <laughs> Wave your hand. That's Rosa. not the woman, but that's Rosa. <laughs> that's Rosa. That's not the woman. <laughs> I mean, she's a she's a woman, but it's uh, the the producer. Um, she spotted a woman at Little Dom's, and she ended up being the visual representation of Lisa. Yeah, so I kept finding myself being drawn in to the film, forgetting it was me, and then forgetting they were puppets at all, and then being reminded they were puppets. And I, yeah, so it was a completely surreal experience for me. Maybe we can take a few questions from the audience. And we, uh, we have a, a Sean, our producer, with the, the mic. Um, yeah, I can't see. Okay. Hey, uh, I had the pleasure to see the New York Theater of the New Year, including Sawbones and Hope Leaves the Theater. Um, and then, I guess a short time later, on the West Coast, Sawbones again and Anomalisa. Can maybe Charlie explain how did you move from Hope Leaves the Theater to Anomalisa? Did those two projects generate at the same time, or how did you choose which to perform? Well, what happened was, um, when we did the theater for the new year, um, it was Coen Brothers um, had Sawbones and I had Hope Leaves the Theater, and we did that in New York, and then we went to London and did it, and then the Coens couldn't go to Los Angeles, so I wanted to go to Los Angeles, so I, um, I, um, I wrote a second play, and <laughs> so, um, and that was Anomalisa, and then we worked on it here, and then we took it there, but that was, the evening was, both plays. It was Hope Leaves the Theater and Anomalisa. So, yeah. Um, one up here. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Uh, my question was really basic. Uh, was there any sort of significance to uh, the song that was in Japanese at the end? Well, it's a Japanese song. <laughs> uh, it's a Japanese song. So that was significant. <laughs> yeah. Was it a random choice? Um, no, there are no random choices. But I don't, I, you know, it's a, it's a Japanese folk song, a uh, very, very popular folk song. What's it called? Can I keep... Mamatara-san? Mamatara-san. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question about the transition from radio play to stop motion. Even 20 years ago, radio plays weren't a wildly popular medium, so it's a really specific choice to make something a radio play and then to add a very distinct choice of stop motion animation is a huge change to what that creature, the original story, is. And I wanted to know... How it, how, what your feelings were, what your involvement was in bridging that really large gap? Well, I mean, it wasn't, I describe it as a radio play, but it, technically we were calling them sound plays, and, which is essentially the same thing, but it, is, it isn't for the radio. It was for, it was for a stage performance where you know, you're creating this, through the dialogue and the music, you're creating this imagery. And um, because it was the three actors on stage, a lot of it was, well, well, there were certain things, for example, that were left ambiguous, like, like what is wrong physically with Lisa is never expressed in the dialogue, and I, I like that, you know. Um, and then also there's the conceit of the actors on stage clearly not engaged in the things that you're hearing they're engaged in. So, for example, the sex scene um, was David and um, whatever your this name one. is. This one. Um, <laughs> Um, um, moaning in, across the stage from each other, you know? So it played uh, funny and because, of the, because of the disconnect between what you're hearing and what you're seeing. So when it became, um, when, it, when it was gonna be brought into a visual form, it, it was uh, um, a question of leaving that stuff behind, you know, that conceit which I liked. And, and trying to figure out well, what is the, what is the um, visual form of this, and what is that, like for example, that scene, but any scene, what do these people look like, what, is, what do all these Tom Noonans look like, you know, which are just voices in the play, and um, you know, those things had to be decided, Duke and I had to decide those things. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. <laughs> 
up front. It's a big, it's a big theater. I'm trying to, you know. Hi, I thought it was a fascinating story how you had all the uh, actors, I mean, with the same voice, except Anna Melissa, who, you know, there was a click. How did you get that idea? How did that come to you? I thought it was so simple, but so amazing. I mean, I was, I had to write this other sort of sound play thing, and I had the opportunity to work with three people, and, um, I was thinking, trying to think of a way to make it seem like more people. You know, like what could I do to, to take three actors and, and make them into many actors? And I thought, well, one actor could play a lot of different parts. Um, and I had done that sort of in the other play that I did, Hope Leaves the Theater, that we were talking about. But the actors were literally changing their voices. And um, I didn't want to do that thing again. So I thought, well, what if one of the actors doesn't change his voice? And I'd read about something called the Fregoli Delusion which is the belief that um, everybody else in the world is the same person and, um, and, and pretending to be other people. And I thought that was an interesting sort of metaphorical thing for, for this character to suffer from. Not literally that he suffers from it, but, but sort of what it, what it represents in terms of his inability to see other people. Um, so that's where the idea came from. Which then, which then becomes the name of the hotel, right? Just in, it became the name of the hotel because we couldn't get the rights to the name of the hotel in Cincinnati that we used in the play, which is, <laughs> which is the Millennium Hotel. They wouldn't give it to us. So I had used it as my pen name for the play, and um, so um, we just gave it to the hotel. Was there anything else that changed for those, those reasons? Did the song change? Yeah, the song yeah. changed. It was originally My Heart Will Go On, um, <laughs> which you know, we couldn't afford, and, and also, it played fun, very funny, you know, and I think, I think the song plays less, less so and more moving, because um, I think it, it represents Lisa more, and the other one felt like, you know, it feels more like it's sort of a little bit of a comment on her being naive, you know, um, which I don't think, I don't think Girls Just Want to Have Fun feels like, and, um, Casablanca was the movie that he was watching on television, and we couldn't get the rights to that. So we, we found My Man Godfrey, and it's in public domain, so we're able to use that. And, um, and that, was a, that was a better choice, too, because it's a fun scene, and it's, it's very act, you know, very act, active scene. Maybe it, well, we can take one last question from the audience. Hi, um, thank you for the movie, thank you for presenting it here. Uh, I guess my question has to do with the sense of claustrophobia that Michael is feeling, and I wanted to know to what degree you want the audience to likewise feel this anxiety at seeing the same face, hearing the same voices. I was reminded of being in John Malkovich, obviously, where John Malkovich goes into his own portal, and there's that scariness of seeing the same face, which is himself, and I just was curious what because I know I felt his feelings, and I didn't know at what point you wanted us to transition away from him or stay with him in that anxiety. Do you, you want to answer that? I can. Okay. Uh, it, yes, we wanted people to be very uh, in Michael's point of view, and we wanted to share his experience of claustrophobia and isolation and loneliness, and we spent a lot of time... <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, hold it. You should come yeah. up here. You don't need a microphone. <laughs> yeah, you're, we hear you very clearly. Uh, yes, we wanted people to uh, identify with Michael's experience of isolation and claustrophobia, and we, we accomplished that uh, through um, uh, lighting and uh, depth of field and, and some of our angle choices. Uh, there's a, there's d differences that take place between when Michael's alone in the environment, and later when he's with Lisa, um, there's differences in the lighting and the depth of field and, and just the overall aesthetic, and also sound. You know, with stop motion, there's no sound, obviously. It's everything silent, so you're building the sound up from the bottom. Like, every little detail of sound is created as well, just like the environment, every detail is created, um, and the performance, every detail is created. So, yes. 
And also, I, I just want to add that, um, you know, we wanted the claustrophobia of everyone being Tom broken by when, that Michael feels when he, when he hears Jennifer's voice for the first time, which is like probably 25 minutes into the movie. Um, we wanted that, the audience to feel that, the way Michael feels it. So having the constant sort of bombardment of, of Tom Noonan, um, <laughs> which is usually a good thing, but um, we were, you know, work, working that so that when you first hear her, you know, you feel that sort of relief that he feels. Well, thank you all for this thank beautiful you. work. Thank you, thank thank you, you. Jennifer, thank you, Charlie, Jennifer. Duke. Thank you so much.